Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Magia Mindset. Today's guest is an absolute honor. He has worked for one of the most prestigious clubs in the world, in Manchester United Football Club. He has also been an assistant coach and sports performance director for the England national team at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. He has worked alongside head coaches such as Sir Alex Ferguson, Louis van Gaal, Roy Hudson. He is currently the sports performance director and assistant coach for the Wales national team alongside head coach Ryan Giggs. It is my pleasure to introduce Tony Stewardwick. Roll the intro. How you doing? How you doing, Sean? You okay, buddy? I'm doing good. I appreciate you putting the time to join the Magia Mindset. Um, cool. Truly, truly a pleasure. How are um, how are things out there in the UK? Yeah, I think we, we, we're trying to get back to normal, Sean. I mean, um, the Premier League is up and running, as, as you probably well saw last night. I think it's different. I mean, I think the experience, the football experience is, is very different from what you know, it was before in terms of the crowd, the atmosphere and what it feels like. So um, it it is what it is. I mean, like I say, I think this is going to be the norm, new norm for the foreseeable future and until things things change. But teams have been back in. Uh, training's gone well. I mean, from, from my own perspective, uh, the, the guys have worked hard. I mean, obviously we had something like um, eight to nine weeks off that we're away from the training ground. We've had short preparation time, which will have ramifications, I'm sure, that you know we're trying to squeeze in something like, Sean, nine games in 30 days. And you know they've had pretty much two and a half weeks of full contact training. So it is. It's, very, it's a very condensed experience. So we'll see. I mean, we're, at this moment in time, you know, I think we've, we've done as much as we physically can within the the kind of constraints that we're working with. And, and I guess we'll see over the next, the next 30 days. How does that challenge your team in kind of uh, preventing those injuries? Because like you said, it's so congested. They got to come back. You guys got to manage them. How is that working out with this unique time? Because we've never gone through anything like this, especially in the sports performance area. You guys have to quickly adapt and get them ready to compete. Yeah, I, I think... I won't necessarily say, necessarily say we've had to break rules, but we've had to try and prioritise, Sean, because you know normally you'll have a six-week period going into a regular season, right? So mm -hmm. what we've had to try to do is condense an experience into essentially three weeks. You know, the first week and a half of that was was essentially non-contact, so we couldn't have contact training, we couldn't use indoor gym facilities. For health and safety reasons so what we've had to try to do is prioritize what's going to give us the biggest bang for the buck so a lot of field-based work um i mean one of my kind of my kind of things was that i really wanted to, to try to get them up you know to put some volume into the into the players but with that we couldn't do the normal you know strength and conditioning work the injury prevention work so and I think when, if you think in terms of buckets of, you know, if you've got five or six buckets of priorities, we've had to really focus on the, the two or three things that that really going to try and give us the maximum return. And that's been a challenge across the staff. I think there's also been other challenges working within, within a team environment that some of our staff have, are still on what we call furlough. So they're not allowed, to, well, I mean, it's a government scheme to, to essentially save money. So we've been working pretty much on a skeleton staff and with that again you know we're asking a lot of our, our members as staff and, and the, the the provision that that were in that was in place in terms of sports science support soft tissue therapy etc etc it really has been a rather limited experience that we're giving to the players so that's been a challenge it's been a challenge from the player's perspective um, in terms of we've put a lot more kind of responsibility onto the players because they've got to be more self-managing because they're not going to get the soft tissue, the massage and, and everything that comes with their, their normal experience. So 
So that's been a challenge. And of course, managing the staff in, in terms of working long days and long hours and asking a lot from people, you know, that, 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 that in itself has, has, has yielded challenges, Sean. No, for sure. When is um, the next competition for Wales? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're back September. Remember, Sean, um, two, two fixtures, international fixtures in September. We have three fixtures in October and three in November. So, again, it's going to be it's going to be back to business as usual. But, uh, you know, it will be, you know, that w- in itself will come with different challenges as well. No, oh, perfect. What I wanted to kind of get our, our podcast going in was um, I wanted to get the conversation started with Manchester United. Obviously, okay. one of the, the bigger biggest clubs you've worked with and dealing with um, very high-level coaches as well, um, working there as well. I wanted to talk to you more about uh, the coaches, the coaching style, how as a sports performance coach you adapted to each one, mm-hmm. and um, what made them different, special in their own way as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, going back to my time at Manchester United, it was, a. I think, first and foremost, it was, a, it was a very, very stable environment, Sean. So there wasn't kind of chopping and changing of staffs that you, you, you normally get working at other clubs. So Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, over his 20, you know, nearly 25-year tenure, it, it, it was one of, one of the great things about Sir Alex that he, he created longevity and he created stability, which, 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 which is, a, is a great environment to work in because you know that, you have to adapt and evolve every single year, but you know relatively that you know as long as you do your job, then then, then pretty much you know you, it's relatively stable. I think when you're working in that kind of environment, I think particularly with with what we had at the time, we had we had we, we didn't just have eleven world class players; we had nearly two squads of world class players, each of them in their own right or internationals, uh, or most of them internationals. So you have world class players, and I think. One of the things that that probably stood out and, and made that environment unique was, was probably a, a collaborative, a collaborative coaching style, a collaborative environment where, um, obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson was was at the head of the pile and he he set the agenda. But 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 really speaking, the way that we worked was that, that it, it'd be it won't necessarily be negotiation, but it was more collaboration. So players would, you know, they would come into the training ground and they would have a plan in what they, how they wanted to drive their own kind of progression. Uh, at the time, my first year, Sean, I worked with uh, a fantastic coach, uh, Carlos Kiros, uh, mm. very diligent. Um, actually, uh, Carlos has had, had a fantastic career, worked in the USA, I believe. Um, uh, I think at the national level, has uh, obviously worked uh, you know, all over the world, Portuguese national manager, being Real Madrid as well. So, um, so for Carlos, he was he, he's very diligent in his planning. So he was very much detail detail orientated. So you, you have to adapt to that kind of style because he wanted detail. He wanted reports. He wanted a reporting strategy that was in place that really that gave him information information and insights to the to you know to adapt and, and evolve the training. When Carlos uh, when Carlos left, we had uh, Mick Phelan in place and Rennie Munenstein. Rennie Munenstein's a, a, a Dutch coach, uh, still working at international level with uh, with Australia. And again, it was a very very fluid process, Sean. And I think that was the again. I think when you work with top players and you work a, a fantastic organisation like Manchester United, it's very fluid. It's very fluid in that everybody knows their job, everybody knows their responsibility, and again, you know, we all knew our roles really. So my my job essentially was to ensure the physical preparation of the players. So that really attuned itself with 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 the coaching delivery, and it was very much what I would call certainly collaborative and collaboration, but it was very very much an integrated coaching philosophy. So the physical piece, which is which is my kind of experience and and, and bag really that that sort of molded into the, the technical and tactical stuff so it was very much a holistic process where it was, was very very integrated no that's so great how you said that i had a interview with omid namazi uh he was an assistant coach for carlos kiros at iran national team uh yeah. in, in iran and one of the things carlos was telling omid was at manchester united you had the players um, they had an assistant to everything. They had they had them already schedule how they get from home 
to the field, the training grounds, what they do there, what they eat, everything. So all they have to do is worry about performance. So yeah. it, it just kind of, in a nutshell, with you, you just validated their, the professionalism, not with the coaching staff so much, but within the whole organization. And that kind of structure, it's hard because for Carlos going to Iran, it didn't have that world-class structure and professionalism. Um, so like to me, that was very, very interesting how you even did that on his meticulous view as a coach. Um, so no, I mean, that was very, um, refreshing. I want to kind of transition from that to our next part, um, with the athletes you've dealt with, you know, from the, from the Cristiano Ronaldo's to the Zlatan to Gareth Bale, you know, I think there was a recent one where, there was a doctor at Real Madrid saying Gareth Bale is the best athlete I've dealt with. And I think he was even um, putting him past Cristiano Ronaldo. And wow. I, think, I think those are perspectives or perceptions. But to me, it's kind of hard to... I haven't, when you even break down the science part, past Ronaldo. He's been, he's been a very special... With the balance of his work ethic, when you hear about all the stuff you do. You working with them behind the scenes, obviously we hear stuff in the media, we hear it in these kind of aspects. What is it the eye test that you see, especially being a sports performance coach, mm-hmm. athletically? Uh, and I'm just throwing Zlatan, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Gareth Bale out there as just the more polarizing yeah. names. But overall, all the athletes you've dealt with, who stood out to you and why did they st- stand out to you? And you know, what made them different? I think when you talk about um, and really what we're talking about, not only an elite player, but we're talking about the tip of the arrow, um, really, that, that, that there, even within a lot of athletes you work with, there, 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 there is a minuscule component of players that just take the game onto another level. So what we're talking about now are, are the game changers, the ones that really you know, push the boundaries of human performance. So... And I think, it beca- you know, when we talk about who's the best athlete and there are so many different parameters, whether, you know, we set up at Manchester United a, a laboratory program and I didn't have the, I didn't actually have the, the pleasure of working with Zlatan at Manchester United because I, I dropped down into the academy. Mm. Then. But when we talk about, you know, the, the strength and power profile and benchmarks and so on and so forth, yeah, Zlatan, even at Man United level, Zlatan stood out because, I mean, you can see, you know, he's, he's incredibly strong and powerful and it's just a unique unique athlete in terms of everything about him. So, but I didn't necessarily have that. Now, my definition really, and, and, and I, I talk about uh, two two things really, beyond everything else, and we accept that at the top level that, that you know, these guys are going to be incredibly strong and incredibly powerful and quick and everything that goes with that. But the the two things I look for, certainly number one will be robustness or resilience. Now, when we talk about the greats and we talk about the great athletes and we have to think about longevity in their career. So for me, it's got to be Cristiano Ronaldo. And the reason being, Sean, is because his ability to sustain performance week after week, you know, season after season at Manchester United. One, one of the key metrics I look at in terms of, you know, the elite players and what we call the high performance players will be, you know, what I, I metric I call, you know, the number of ga- days per game. So what that looks at is that over the season, the duration of the season, how many, how many days do they average between games and and in Man- at Manchester United, Cristiano Ronaldo, I think he, he averaged a game every you know, 3.6 days. So for me, when we talk about resilience, robustness, and you know, a majority of that or a big part of that is, is physical robustness and physical resilience. But certainly within that, Sean, is also the professionalism that allows him to sustain the levels of performance. So there is a mental component to that. There's a mental resilience to get up every day and train every day and prepare your body you know, for the most intense phases of the game. So, yeah, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo is, is a standout. The, I mean, the other, the other one and, and the other component to that is around movement quality and efficient, efficiency of movement because, you know, if you're playing... And again, when we, when we look back at that Manchester United team, we had players playing 50, 60 games a year, Sean. Not just for Manchester United, but an international level as well. So that ability to knock out 50, 60 games a year is very, very unique. 
and again to sustain that level of performance over a long period of time and you've got to be an efficient mover and you've got to have a level of efficiency as an athlete to absorb forces to withstand forces and obviously to be efficient efficient in movement um and you look at the greats they all move well there's a movement quality there's a there's a there's a graceness about the best athletes and you know, coming on to, to Ryan Giggs. And when we talk about longevity, no more so, I mean, I'm not being, you know, there's no favoritism here because I work with Ryan. He's my boss at the moment. But, you know, to sustain the career that he had over, you know, a 20-year period at one of the biggest clubs in the world, that that's very, very unique. And that doesn't come, Sean, just part of that is is, is kind of, you know, your genetic profile, you know, the genes that you're born with and the ability to, to be quick and, and gracious. But, you know, some of that is learned and some of that is certainly the levels of professionalism required to sustain that are incredible. So for me, you know, when we look at it, um, certainly Cristiano Ronaldo was a standout athlete that I worked with. Uh, I've only really worked with, with, with Gareth, Gareth Bell over the last couple of years. But yeah, in, in, in the same vein, I mean, you, you look at Gareth, he's incredibly quick, uh, he's incredibly strong. Um, and, and, and again, one of the standout features of, of Gareth Bale and Christian, they're both in, incredible, incredibly consummate professionals, you know, don't go out, you know, partying and drinking and look after themselves, ensure that all the kind of peripheral support, the ancillary to support is around them. And it comes back a little bit to your Carlos Quiros quote is that, you know, yes, we, we provided everything for the players, but there's also a self-management strategy. So Cristiano Ronaldo was the first one in the training every day. You know, and I'm sure Gareth Bale, you know, at Real Madrid, I don't work at Real Madrid, at, at Wales. Gareth's one of the, the first first players in the gym every day. He does his, you know, he does his routine. He's, he's got a set pattern of how he does things and he's very, very diligent. So it doesn't happen by chance. So, you know, it, it's almost setting yourself up for success. And I think, you know, you've only got to see that with, 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 with you know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of attention with Michael Jordan and, and, you know, the last dance and so on and so forth. But it's no different. I mean, when we're talking about that kind of, you know, minute detail, that, 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 that passion to want to take the game to another level, the levels of professionalism that require to train hard, train smart every single day. And again, to sustain that over, over, over a, a long period of time, Sean, that, 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 they're, they're the things that really stand out. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic, Tony. And I, it kind of segues us into our next part where uh, discussing the mindset. And I think right. th that is so vital. I mean, yes, you need to have the talent to kind of put you in that door, but it's the mind, mindset, the mentality that you put behind your work. And I, and I don't want to really only focus on the players. I want to focus on, for example, someone in your field someone as the players, the, the head coaches, everyone that's maybe at that highest level, at that highest level, what is the mindset? And we kind of touch based on it, showing up early, putting in that extra work, being meticulous, exactly detailed to what you eat, what you put into your body. If you're performing, if you're a sports performance coach, what are you researching? What are you putting in? How do you look after? Do you stay longer and evaluate your players? The exact detail it gets, especially Man United, Wales at national level, at club level, these are highest levels. When you go into that company, you're dealing with very, very elite people that are kind of, we, we talked about Michael Jordan at the last time. The reason companies are successful there, everybody's twitched on that right way. I, I want to kind of, dissect that kind of the characteristics it takes and what does a day look what does a day look for those individuals when do people at your level show up when do they leave the thing when do they go home is it right go home and relax and then start the day again the next day mm. yeah i mean i think we'll we tease out a couple of couple of them, the, the, them key points i think like one of the um i mean I mean, I'll sort of go back in history a little bit. When Sir Alex Ferguson won the, the European Cup in 1999, they moved from uh, a very traditional training ground, which was called the Cliff, which was was, was essentially a, a very, very small building. And they moved into this kind of new new centre at Carrington. That was, 
you know that that was at sort of like the, t- the 1999 2000 and at the time it was one of the best best but best training grounds in the world if not the best training ground in the world i mean obviously now a lot of clubs have have sort of taken that onto another level but one the mantra behind sir alex ferguson is that he wanted to create a player home he wanted to create the best environment for his players to thrive so everything was was was, was really really supported and it wasn't just the players sean it would be the staff so everything around the design of the training training center was around the player and the staff experience so ensuring that there's contact between players and staff, ensuring that there's separate areas where the players can can work on different things, whether it be technical, tactical, whether it can be the kind of um, medical facilities and so on and so forth. So what what you essentially do it, it, at the highest level is create the best best working environment. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, spend millions of pounds on that. Is that, you know, essentially you're just ensuring that there are cert- certain parts to your daily routine and, you know, how you build or how you build a facility really is, is, is the kind of player experience you want to generate. So that, that's the kind of first bit is that one, you have the, the environment to really to support, support world-class level. I think the, the other thing, and particularly around, around Manchester United, and, and David Beckham had a fantastic quote years ago. He said, the most important thing wasn't being at United. It was working hard enough to make sure they'd let me stay. And I think that was really, for me, that was kind of every day, you, you know, I enjoyed going into work every day. Um, you know, I'd, I'd get up at 5 o'clock, 5.30 to ensure that, that I was there to, to have kind of, you know, some kind of contact with the manager and contact with the staff. Everything was planned for the day because essentially when the players start to arrive from, you know, 8, 8 o'clock, 8.30 onwards, they'll have, you know, the breakfast and everything that put on for them, so on and so forth, is ensuring that, you know, what you're going to do, it's not, it, it's planned, Sean. It doesn't happen by chance. Success doesn't happen by chance. In any level of sport participation at the top, top, top level, it, you know, success doesn't happen by chance. You have to, you have to create the right environment. You have to have the the right processes in place. You have to have the right staff in place, and you have to have the right operations in place. So, you know, everything around that and all the kind of training discussions would happen well before the players start to arrive. And then, of course, now what it looks like is that what you now want to do is ensure that there's contact between player and staff. So what, what you don't want to do, and you know, you've got 20 world-class players that, that, that come in for breakfast and they'd start their pre-activation and, and, in, and strength and conditioning programs and so on and so forth. And it, you know, it, it's a very, again, that's quite collaborative and it's very much individualized. It's, you know, players work on what they need to work on. Uh, and then really there was a kind of, there was a journey into training, Sean, and you know there was the training training session itself. Post training would always be, you know, we couldn't get the players off the training 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 pitch. Some days it was very very difficult, and the biggest challenge and the biggest kind of stress for Carlos Kiros was you know ma- making sure that I went round and tried to drag the players off because they didn't want to come off the training field because that was such the level of competition that. People would look around and, and see, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo taking free kicks. They'd see Wayne Rooney, you know, doing finishing practice. They'd see Rio Ferdinand working on his headers with with Nemanja Vidic, and it's that everybody wanted to be a part of that. So what you now have, you now have this collective kind of professionalism that really is is, is a force multiplier. Everybody wants to be part of it, and now players are looking over their shoulders, say, "Well, if I don't keep up with them, they're going to get away from me." So that that's the kind of you know when we look at this daily experience where. Very planned, very diligent. No, no stone is left unturned. And now you've got, you, you know, you, you've got athletes that are very attuned to what the requirements are. And within that, you know, the pressure now becomes not necessarily with the manager because, again, one of the greatest things about Sir Alex Ferguson was was trust and empowerment. So it was like, you know, he, he would bring, he brought Tony Strubick in, in to, to to take care of the physical piece. Let you know, trust and empower Tony Strubick to do that. So now, from my perspective. You know, one of the greatest managers of all time has empowered me with that level of trust. And now I don't want to live down, Sean. So there's a, there's a collective bond there. So that kind of trust and I just think the pressure working with them kind of players is that every day you have to be ready for a player, you know, whether it be Cristiano Ronaldo or Ryan Giggs to come to you and say, right, how can you improve my game? What are you going to do as a, as a coach? What are you going to do as a practitioner to improve my game? They've got a plan. Because they're, you know, they're incredibly talented, they're planned, you know, and, and they're, they're in tune with the coaching process. So us, it puts pressure on us to ensure 
that when a player reaches out to you or you reach back to a player is that, okay, th- this is what my suggestion is. And now you kind of have this kind of, you, you build, relate, it's like a relation, relationship-based coaching. You build this kind of rapport with a player and, you know, that with that comes trust, player, staff, and you don't want to break that. So th- there's a consistency in your delivery. So th- that was really the pressure from, from a staff perspective. And then obviously, when I first started at Manchester United, we um, we didn't really have a massive sports science and, st- and strength and conditioning department. So my job really was to build build the you know that that level of staff you know and grow that department to to a level where we felt that it wasn't too big that you kind of lost intimacy. But by the same token, we had you know members of staff taking care of the the monitoring, members of staff taking care of the recovery process, and you're ticking all the really really big boxes here, Sean. No, I mean, that's, that's great stuff. That's great stuff. And then I was going to kind of, with that kind of segue into how we were discussing the mindset, the environment, how it becomes collectively built in an organization. Um, the thing that Alex Ferguson, I mean, it stands out. I mean, he did it for so long. He did it for so long. And the, the beautiful part was you experienced both. You experienced that stint of a certain extent of Alex Ferguson. And then after he retires, you, you experienced the transition as well. Mm-hmm. And with the coaching staff, what, what made it difficult? What made it difficult to maintain it, maintain what F- Ferguson had going? And because there was basically you had a, uh, they're slowly, um, they're slowly getting back, but it's still not to where Ferguson had it. I mean, they still have not been able to. I mean, it is a good testament to him, but I think we discuss it as a whole. Whereas not only Alex Ferguson is the whole collective organization, but every head coach brings their staff in. It's their own personal staff, and I think. Um, even when you worked with Jose Mourinho, he had his sports performance staff that you work with as well. So you get to see the diligence on every side. What is it that that transition has been difficult to get back to basically the Ferguson standard? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, you know, that, that's a topic of conversation that, you know, a lot of people, you know, sort of it would talk around over coffees and beers in the pub and so on and so forth. I think essentially when you look back, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, like, you know, you'll have American coaches in, in sort of basketball and, 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 and football over in America that when you've been within an organization and been so incredibly successful so for such an extended period of time, you know, it's very, very difficult to dominate any sport for so long, Sean. And, you know, it, it, it's almost like the, 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 sigma, I think the, the principle, the sigmoid principle, where, you know, it curves and, you know, uh, you know, ups and downs and ebbs and flows. And, you know, that was a cycle that was very, very unique for Manchester United. Because, and they now call it the legacy years because, you know, no other team other than per, perhaps Liverpool in the 1980s have dominated you know, have dominated, uh, you know, the English premiership or, you know, English football for such an extended period of time. So what you, what you then have, and, and Sir Alex Ferguson was, you know, um, God, but he, was, he was irreplaceable, Sean. He was irreplaceable in the fact that, one, that, that what he'd built, and two, his, his in, in, intuitive knowledge over that amount of time of, of how the league works, you know, to the level that, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson would would make kind of little comments like, "Well, if we win today, we'll win the league," and he knew that if we were in touching distance at a certain point within the league, we could still win the league. He would know how to rotate. And we go back to squad rotation and, and the management and the science behind squad rotation. In his last year at Manchester United, Sir Alex Ferguson made an average of five changes per game. You know that that is ultimate squad rotation, Sean. Wow. Now, it wasn't always Premier League games and it was cup games. Sir Alex Ferguson had the the you know. It, and he did that intuitively. There was no science driving that process. But when we look back, science supports it. You know, how to rotate squads, how to create a talent pipeline. You know, even now, the players that are coming into some the Manchester United, you know, Marcus Rashford, Jesse Lingard, they really spawned out of, of Sir Alex Ferguson's talent pipeline because they work with, with, with coaches like Paul McGuinness that have been at the club for, for 20-odd years. So even now, you know, six... 
seven years, you know, Sir Alex retired in 2013. Seven years after, you know, Sir Alex retired from the football club, you know, we're still reaping the rewards of what Sir Alex built at the football club. You know, Marcus Rashford and, and, and all the positive plaudits that he's getting and so on and so forth. So when we talk about transition, it was very, very difficult. Going back to that, Sean, we didn't just lose Sir Alex Ferguson. We lost uh, Chief Exec David Gill that had a very, very close relationship with Sir Alex. We lost Mick Phelan at the time. We lost Eric Steele, the goalkeeper coach. We lost Reddy, Reddy Mullenstein. Uh, and some of them decisions were uh, were made by the staffs themselves. Some some decisions were made by the incoming staff that come in. But what you essentially lost in one summer was was over was nearly a hundred years of corporate knowledge, of corporate identity that knew the fabric, the DNA of the football club, that knew the fabric, the DNA of of, of, of success. That was a very very solid build. So you know. When David Moyes arrived with his coaching team, for, for David Moyes, it was, it was very, very difficult. I think it would have been difficult for anyone. And when you look back, you might say that, you know, you look back on Louis van Gaal's tenure and Jose Mourinho's tenure and you think, well, they might not be as, you know, have had that longevity and success that Sir Alex Ferguson had. I don't think, you know, I think the modern game's very different, Sean. Contextually, years ago, managers would get more time. There'd be more time to build. And what Sir Alex did, he built, you know, and you look at the most successful franchises across world sport, they build for the future. They have a talent pipeline. They have, a, you know, an unbelievable talent identification process, a scouting network. So it doesn't happen by chance and it takes time to build. You know, straight after, you know, within, within four or five years, Manchester United go from having a manager in place for 25 years to having three managers in five, six seasons. So it's a very, very different, completely different model. You know, and that's driven by, it's a different time, it's a different context, and, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about transition, I don't think anybody that come in, and you have a look at, you know, even the managers that have been, David Moyes, Dave, while David Moyes didn't win trophies at Everton, David Moyes built, you know, over, over his, his tenure at Everton Football Club, he built, you know, a sustained, you know, level of performance where, you know, Everton were, they weren't, sort of challenging for championships, but they, 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 they were performing year on, year out. And he built that. He built teams with work ethic. And I think that's why Sir Alex Ferguson felt that from his perspective, David Moyes was the right person for the job. Then you look at Louis van Gaal. Louis van Gaal was coach at some of the biggest and best franchises and, 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 and football clubs in, in world sport. He's been, at, you know, been at Man United. He's been at Barcelona, Ajax. You know, he's the, 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 the Dutch national team level. Jose Mourinho is one of the most successful managers of all time. So it's not necessarily about that, but it, it, I think it, it, it's just almost a perfect storm, Sean, of a number of different of interacting variables. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of culture. And when, you know, it takes time to build a new culture. You know, there's got to be patience on the behalf of the fan base, the key stakeholders. And, you know, you've got to, you know, each manager thereafter then then comes comes into an environment where they want to create their own identity with the team. They want to bring their own players in with the team. You know, with that comes pressures because the club want want to retain some kind of level of identity. But you know, so you go from you know we talk about transition, and it it it, 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 it I think it was beyond transition. Transition for me <laughs> looks at something that's smooth and evolving. For Manchester United, it was very quick. It was very rapid. You know, so it wasn't necessarily. Uh, it, it wasn't transition for me. It was a very, very quick change where a lot of, lot of things were different. Um, and that's not looking back. That's not to say that, you know, uh, David Moyes, Louis van Gaal or Jose Mourinho foul, but it, it was very, very different. And I think anybody, you know, the, the best managers in the world, it, it, it would have taken time really to rebuild. Now, on top of that, Sean, you lose Sir Alex Ferguson in that last season you know, Ryan, Ryan Giggs, well, certainly after David Moyes, you, you know, Ryan went onto the coaching team. You lost his playing experience. You lost Paul Scholes, you know, and you've lost and you end up losing a number of players that have been at the football club for 20 odd years. So it wasn't just, you know, the managers that were changing, that the kind of whole team had started to change. You know, players, players were getting older, players were moving on. So it was completely different. So it was really a rebuild. Um, and again, looking back, you know, people will say, should they, you know, should David Moyes have kept 
certain staff in place. Well, what you've got to also appreciate is that David Moyes needs people around him that he's comfortable with and working with. It's like any, any coach in any, any organisation. It wasn't unrealistic to expect David Moyes to do that. It's the same with Louis van Gaal. He brought seven staff in. Jose Mourinho brings seven staff in. And they do that because it's a different model to Sir Alex Ferguson's because it's, it's more of a, a kind of quicker, you know, stay at a club two, three years, move on, whatever that model looks like. Very, very different from that kind of long, you know, build for the future, have the time and so on and so forth. So not only was, you know, it about different managers, it was about a completely different model, Sean. And within that, also, you, you lose a lot of players within that. You, you, you lo- lost some of the greatest players that have ever graced the premiership in, in skulls and gigs. You know, how do you replace skulls and gigs? How, how vital was that class? That class? Uh, it was probably, the you know, f- for Sir Alex Ferguson, for me, it's, you know, part of his genius was, was, was one, trusting in youth, um, and two, really shaping the future of the football club with, with a group of players at the class of 92 that, again, you, you, you probably had it that, you know, the same at Barcelona with, with, with Xavi, Iniesta, Pio, um, Victor Valdez, uh, and then latterly, uh, obviously, Messi that came through that. When you have a group of players that, that know each other and that have been in the football club for a long period of time, it, it's invaluable. And that influence that that group of players from you know, from, from David Beckham to, to Gary Neville's, both Neville's, uh, to Nicky Butt. So all them players that come through the system was invaluable. But, but again, it was a join, it was really a join to the manager's philosophy, Sean, in building for the future, giving you a chance, creating a runway and a platform into, into, the, into the first team. So, so what you have is that over time, you build and evolve a very, very successful strategy. And I well, must say, I mean, looking... I mean, I mean, I, I in the la- in my last couple of years at Manchester United, we had some some fantastic players coming through coming through into the team. You're seeing that now. We, you know, you've got you know, with Lingard, Rashford, um, you know, Scott McTominay. Th- these players that you know you cultivate, and I do think they've got five or six players that have been at the club for for a long period of time. Um, Mason Greenwood's the, the, one of the last ones now, and obviously Brandon Williams. You've got. And obviously, Dean Anderson as well to come back from from Sheffield United. Now you've got six or seven players that could be the next generation of of, of Manchester United footballers that could win you the European Cup. No, I mean, I think it's it's such a how you say building, you know, coaching style. It's so important because Jose Mourinho, Louis Van Gaal, fantastic coaches, mm-hmm. fantastic, like detail oriented. I mean, we talked about Carlos Quiroz. Jose Mourinho is a detailed coach as well in their yeah. own way. It's just different styles, different styles. You could have maybe said, could have Guardiola come in because he's the type of plan for the future, develop the youth kind of player where Jose is more, can, what are they going to do for me now? I got to win right now. It's not focused so much on the youth. It's different styles. And it could have been, Possibly with, with Jose and Louis, and you know it better, was a tug of war with the organization because organization's identity and culture could be, it's bringing the youth this way. They're like, I want to buy these players. And, you know, that worked with Ferguson because they established that for how many years? And it's tough. It's tough to just come in. I mean, I want to kind of now segue to... Uh, more in your field in the sports performance um and you know there's there's so much debate on how it has evolved with technology being involved now where when you probably were starting out technology wasn't at hand as it is now um there's still coaching staffs that um don't believe in technology uh i think going back to the interview i had with Omid Namazi talking about Carlos Quiroz was he loves his whiteboard and he would take his whiteboard and he doesn't believe in the, the, the computer aspect of it. And everybody has where they, they love to do everything on an iPad, everything. Some coaches, they don't like that. They still want to do everything with pads and ev- evolutions. But as a coach, I want to kind of start the conversation with the performance when you're dealing with individuals that maybe are technology savvy and how you adapt to that, but the ones that are not 
the tech savvy and they don't want to get too much into it. How do you adapt to working? Because it's all about collaborating. How do you work yeah. with that? And do you have any stories of dealing with certain individuals that you're like, you know what, they're doing it this way, but I got to adapt to it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, going back, I mean, one thing you can say about Sir Alex Ferguson, he wasn't a sports scientist, but what, what Sir Alex Ferguson was committed to was innovation. And I think he, you know, he changed his assistant manager on a number of occasions. He was one of the first managers to, to bring a pre-match meal in. He looked at kind of vision science. And I mean, for Sir Alex Ferguson, he was the ultimate sports scientist in one respect, Sean, because you know, sports science is really looking for innovation. Sports science is looking for ways to push the boundaries of performance. And that's pretty much what he was. We just bring that scientific purpose bit, but you know, the, the, you know, the caveat to that that kind of discussion there is that if I would have if I would have gone in and put a, a ten page report, detailed report on data and analytics on Sir Alex Ferguson's desk, it would have still been there three months later. You know, he wouldn't, wouldn't have read it. So, you know, as a practitioner, and particularly modern practitioners, and, 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 and I, I, I tell them all the time, is that you've got to find a way to communicate with a coach. Our role. You know, obviously we have to manage players, but our role is to find a way to communicate and align yourself to the coach. And you, that's not that's not always easy. That's not, you know, that can be challenging, particularly in this kind of technology-rich environment we now live in. Um, you know, and there are a number of coaches now, and I think it, it's balance needs to be struck. You know, on the on, on the one hand, there's the, the kind of the iPad generation, the iPad coach. You know, on the other hand, there's the kind of your intu- intuitive coach that doesn't really care much for technology and GPS data and so on and so forth. I think it's balanced to be struck. But I think, you know, one of the, the key roles as a, as a practitioner, as a sports scientist, is to, is to sell your product. So data is one way of selling your product to a coach. You know, if he's concerned about a level of performance, a player's level of performance, it's one way, you know, to, to provide that data and insights. And we've got to provide insights to the coach. Because when we talk about the coaching process, you know, we have to deliver insights that impact on performance. So find a way to do that. Now, you know, for some coaches, it might be a two, three minute, you know, conversation. You might have small windows and corridors with a coach on a daily basis. So you've got to find ways to communicate with a head coach. And whether that's kind of, you know, and that's where you've got to find out what their kind of style is. You know, is, is it kind of um, data driven? Is it more touchy feely and whatever that looks like? And then we've got to attune ourselves with that. So that's part of our responsibility to, 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 to sell that backwards. I think the, um, you know, what, one thing's for sure is that, you, you know, when we're talking about competing with analytics and, and for me, you know, data has been a bit, very big part of, of, of my journey. And I think it's something that, that, that I pushed. I think, you know, you know, data is very, very important to me, but sometimes, you know, it's not always as important as you think it is. And I think some, you know, when we talk about the art of coaching and, and, and really the coach's eye, and that was something that Sir Alex would, would always talk about, you know, one of the key, key, you know, successful components for any coach is observation looking at the player and you know whether you know sometimes the information and the insights that we deliver to the coach would support that you know and I, I think when you get that then you, you really get this kind of perfect storm of what successful performance looks like no that's great and I wanted to start it off with that but now kind of get into how you're dealing with the national team as well as dealing with the um, uh, club you've dealt with the club level as well uh, what is the priorities for each if we can compare and contrast discussing what are the priorities for the national team um, mm. what are what are the tests that you're looking to kind of break down if we're now entering the science world of it and mm. in your particular field when you're checking in your players for, for national team camps what are the things you're looking at to kind of he's good to go He's good. He still needs work. And then at the club level, what's the difference you guys look at at that level to see if they're good to go? Yeah, I mean, I think that the fundamental difference is, is what you have at international level is very, very a condensed experience, Sean. So mm. all your preparation has got to be squeezed into a really, really small period of time. I think the, the other component to that is that essentially clubs develop players. You know, mm. you know, players belong to the clubs. 
you know, we borrow them or loan them, whatever you is, for international. And, you know, so there has to be a collaborative approach between club and in, international, you know, uh, international team. So that, that's really, really important. And, and a fundamental part of my role at Wales is to ensure that, you know, I'm, I'm joined up joined up with the clubs. And, and essentially, you know, the priority, to come back to your question, the priority is to establish readiness to perform. So when every player turns up to camp, establish readiness to perform. So whether that's you know tra- tracking minutes played, tracking performance levels, whatever that looks like, whatever metrics you want to use, establishing readiness in that kind of five-day period, looking at kind of pl- what I would call playing momentum. So does the player come into the camp having played regularly for a set amount of time? And I think one of the biggest challenges, and I actually experienced this when I went to uh, the World Cup in, in Brazil with England, is that you know, when you take a number of players that, that pick up an injury to the back end of the season, even though they could be your star player, if they're not coming into the camp, camp with what I would call physical momentum, i.e., you know, you know, I think every athlete has this kind of rhythm, you know, this kind of, you know, this, this kind of performance level, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, but they come into that and, and athletes look for a rhythm. And, you know, the best performance is generally with the players that come into a camp or come onto an international tournament, you know, with, with playing minutes behind them. So they're not coming in, not sharp, not match ready and so on and so forth. Um, so again, you know, the, the priorities internationally will establish that, establish where the players are at. Um, and obviously a condensed, really, everything has got to be squeezed so Every session you do at international level, you've got to maximise the return of what you do. So, you know, your warm-ups and all your activation stuff and a lot of my warm-ups at international level will be position-specific because not only can you get the physical component, but you can also get the tactical stuff. So I I link up with the coaches and we do, you know, unit unit warm-ups and so on and so forth. And it's multiple outcomes in in a warm-up where at club level, you've got a bit more time to develop the players. You can work with the players. I think you're... You kind of you, you can establish longer term time frames of where players are at, and, and you have more time to do them. Where everything at international is very very condensed. And you know, we kind of touched back. One of your challenges was um, the 2014 Brazil with England when you were out there with England. It's tough because now with the EPL being such a high demand league as it is. And the season being so long, so much money behind it when they're working at that elite level. As the eye test, when you're watching a lot of these very world-class players performing, that's during their break time. That's when they usually will take a break if the World Cup's not happening. But obviously, they got to do the call-up. They go there. They don't look like their usual self that they do in a UEFA Champions League final. When you look at the final of a Champions League final, and then you watch the World Cup, you can see that there's a difference of level because of just the fatigue going into that transition and rest a so vital piece to it. As, as a sports performance coach, when you're getting these, the England national team players checking in, they're coming from a long, demanding EPL season. What are you focusing on? Is it the rest? Is it you're like, okay, I'm, I brought them in. We're going to have a condensed World Cup. Do you say touch work? We test them. We don't, we don't push them with doing, I'm looking for more volume. I'm not looking for volume. What are the specifics you're looking when they finish the season coming into camp in, in a quick time to prep and then go try to, a lot of pressure too, win a World Cup? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think... One, it's about context because, you know, every camp is unique. Uh, every tournament's unique. I mean, I, I had a really good chat with, with with Gary Neville back in 2014 because I worked with Gary Neville was on the coaching staff with uh, with Roy Hodgson and I worked with Gary there. And we had a lot of discussions around that. And, you know, Gary's experience as a player was that, you know, after a very, very long demanding season and, and, and when you look at it, the, the English Premier League and, and also the Championship, you know, English Championship, uh, they're two of the most physically demanding leagues in world football, without a shadow of a doubt. The level of intensity, uh, the competitive nature, very few easy games, Sean. You know, compounded the fact that, 
you know, when, when the team sort of advanced to the latter stages of the Champions League. So, you know, some of the players can come off the back of a, a league season with 50, 60 games. Um, so what do you do? I mean, and, 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 and that's, you know, is a priority rest and restoration? Is a priority to maintain a level of momentum like I spoke about? Because the challenge you then have is, is if you pretty much shut down and rest a player, it then takes time to build that physical momentum again. So do you, do you keep them going? Uh, and I remember, you know, uh, Robin van Persie came back from the World Cup in, in Brazil and, and, and Louis van Gaal did terrific with the, the, the Dutch national team. They had a, a really good campaign. And um, Robin said he felt like, you know, he felt like an orange that had been squeezed because Louis maintained a level of intensity. Louis van Gaal went there, you know, and it was a full-on experience, technical, tactical, work. Um, you know, it was all integrated as, as, as Louis' philosophy was, but he worked them. So it wasn't necessarily a rest for them guys. You know, I, I've worked in, in, in both environments, Sean, where you rest the players, uh, other ones where you really work them and build volume. And I, I don't think there's a the science behind that. I think, I think one thing's for sure is that each and every one of them individuals will come into a camp with, 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 different, with different requirements and, and, and kind of di differences in how we need to prepare them for, for the tournament. So it's not just a... Uh, it's not just a simple template. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And I think that's why you can, you know, wh where you need really to keep tracking your players, looking at performance levels. Because I think going back to that that 2014 World Cup, I think Rooney had got injured late on. I think Danny Welbeck had been injured. We had, had a couple of defenders that had missed the last few games. And then other players that had come off the back of a really, really long demanding season. Now, the challenge for you as a coach in that, that situation is that You've got to prepare a team, you know. So you've got to get your, your tactical work in. So some players will need extra physical work. Some players will need extra rest, and that's the challenge. Really, is managing managing the individual within within a team environment. Now, at a club level, that's a lot easier to do because you have time, and you have an understanding of how you know when you're working with players for three, four, five seasons. You understand when a player looks tired. You understand the markers and the red flags and you know what the kind of benchmarks they're used to. But again, when you come at international level, very, very tight, you know, and you're only getting a snapshot. It's a, it's, a, it's a window in time. That's what you get. And I think, I think for me, um, the science is important, but I think it's really about the art of preparation and coaches' observation and knowing and understanding players uh, because you you really don't have much time, Sean. You know when you when you prepare for a World Cup and you plan for a World Cup, you think you're going to get you know X amount of training sessions, and then what that looks like is that each time you lose training sessions for a number of different you know. And actually, when you look at the time, you, you know your contact time with players is you know it, it, it becomes quite minimal, really. So you have got to try and maximize the time you have with the players. No, I mean, it, it is it is one of those things that um, every camp is different, obviously, and uh, the unique role you play, you got to obviously adapt to the coaching staff, the head coach you have and what he wants to get out of it. So those play a unique factor to to kind of get to our final uh, final two questions um, and kind of uh, close it out as much as uh, this dialogue is so intriguing, so good, we can kind of go go all day all the uh, for so long um my next one wants to get kind of um reaching out for the aspiring player and an aspiring coach you know um getting their foot in that door within a united within a wales you know i think you just said success is not really something that happens overnight it's a lot of hard work is a lot of environment it's a lot of team that goes behind it to make it happen with someone aspiring as a player or a coach that maybe um doesn't have that team yet hasn't got the foot in the door but has that mindset has that mindset to day in day out learn grow develop within that field and wants to be a part of those organizations so they're surrounded by it and they do bring a factor how how do you get your foot in that door how is it that you attract it within the interview how is it that you kind of say you know what you went in there 
And then when you left, they didn't want you to leave because you're like, hey, come back. There's, there's something about yeah. you. You know, how is it, um, Tony? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, to, to, to get your, your foot in the door, Sean, you've got to knock on the door. Mm. And I think with that, and, I, and again, I, you know, with, with the young, and I, and I love I love young people. I, I love being with young people and, you know, uh, young people on the staff. It's great because they have a passion and an energy and and they have an ambition to, to, to want to, to, to learn and move on. So um, I always look really for, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, what's on your resume in, in terms of whether you've worked at a club or whatever club, but it, it's what you've done really to, to build that profile. It's the stuff that you've gone above and beyond. It's the coaching experiences. It's a working with young people. It's the voluntary stuff. It's all that kind of the experience that you have. And you're not expecting a 25, 26 year old practitioner to come in the door, you know, as the end product, you're not, you're not, not trying to do that. I think it's really important that for me, um, I always look at longevity. You know, so when I look at a CV or resumes that can someone hold a job down, are they prepared to do that? Because that looks for me, that that, that, that's a level of commitment and it's a level of, you know, uh, building something that rather than job hopping one job to the next and only spending half a season here and half a season there. Because I think one of the hardest things in professional sports, Sean, is to stay in a job. You know, one of the hardest things at Man United was to stay there for 11, 12 years. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I think with that comes a level of patience. I mean, I had uh, a 24-year-old sort of sports scientist, fitness coach phone me, and I always try and make time for young people, phone me a, a few months ago and said that, you know, he feels he's outgrown his role and he's ready for his next move and he wants to be ahead of performance. He's 24 years of age. Mm. You know, it's like, I didn't get that gig and you know I didn't get that gig until I was 40 years of age and I'm still learning now you know I'm nearly 50 with, with 25 years in, in, in football and you know I, I'm still I'm still learning learning my trade I really I really believe that I mean I've not stopped learning throughout the process and you know going into Sheffield Wednesday the last last year or so I mean it's been an incredible uh, journey and I think I think with that is that try to have diverse experiences so I always say that someone comes in and says, well, yeah, I've got 10, 10 years working with, with a club. Well, is it 10 years working with a club or, you know, is it 10 years of a rich, diverse experience? Because you could be at a club, you know, really, for, you know, doing minimal, minimal kind of roles and never really progressing with it, within that, that position. And I think the big challenge really is when you have young staff in that is ensuring that there is like a bit like, you know, developing players, you've got to de develop staff as well. Is that you've got to give them something, and you you've got to they've got to see kind of progression within their careers. And I think, particularly with the new generation of coaches, this new generation of people that they can be a bit too impatient at times. They want quick success, they want quick results, um, and it takes time. It takes time to to build you know, experience and and learn and having that intuition. So, you know, I mean, the classic stuff is that reach out to people. Um, uh, I mean, I, I talk about it all the time. You know, I, early on in my career, I knocked on the door and wanted to see good people work and went to visit people. And I think one of the, the things you find in our industry, Sean, is that some of the best people, or sorry, some of the best practitioners are the best people. Mm. You know, mm. you get on the phone to a Vern Gambetta. He's, he's had one of the, 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 the greatest careers in, in sport and, and all them kind of guys that have been around. It's, it's a, you reach out to them, they, they reach back to you and you mm -hmm. find that. You know, don't, don't be scared to, to knock on the door, so to speak. I think have that, you know, have that sort of openness to really reach out to people and try to learn from them. Um, be patient. Um, and again, it, 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 it's about continuously developing yourself as not just a, a practitioner, but as a, as a coach and as a person as well. And think outside the box. You know, don't always think within the box and, and you know, find out what, what people are doing in other fields. Find out what people are doing in other industries and, 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 and try, to, try to get that rich, diverse experience. That's so valuable, how, how it's so simple, but we forget that, good people, good human beings. You know, I think um, at times um, perception maybe is what you see of them on TV, what you see of them there. They get drawn away. They get intimidated. They get that, that knock on the door. 
Uh, mm. They feel like they have to jump a few fences to knock that door. Instead, yeah. of, instead of if you um, knock on the first gate, they'll still let you in. There's not, no, no wrong way. Of knock. And, and there's a lot of stories where there's some knocks you do that certain individuals might not open. That's part of yeah. it. You have, to, you have to knock. The ones that do, you end up getting that foot in the door. And then from there, you build it. So yeah. it, it's such a great message. And thank you so much, to, uh, Tony, for sharing it. My final question I got for you. This is a little fun yeah. one. We do a, with a lot of our um, guests get their kind of view of um, their childhood experience and how it came about. Favorite team of all time. Favorite oh. player of all time. And it, can, it doesn't have to be in football, but obviously you've been involved in it. You've been around it. So usually end up getting drawn in that direction. The reason I say it can be any sport because I want to say, ask, how did that come about? That favorite mm-hmm. team. And usually a lot of people say it because it's that childhood team. It was the family support or it was that one player that you were, you worked with or you grew up watching. So, and it kind of sat in with you. So if you can kind of uh, give us a perspective of that. Yeah. I mean, I think um, it'd be, it, I think it's an easy one to me to say Man United and, and, and and, and obviously, for me, Ryan Giggs, would, would, that's easy because that's the way I've worked with them. But I think, you know, looking back at teams and um, uh, I, I was from North London. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I grew up in North London. And, and again, my, my first kind of experiences were of Tottenham Hotspur. So mm. uh, I was born three miles from, 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 from the Spurs ground. And my first team and my first game, I went to, went to, went to watch Spurs play. Uh, so, so really... Uh, and then with that, that count sort of that, that came into really Spurs won the, the FA Cup in 1981 and it, sorry, 1980 and 81. And for me, that's everlasting because that was probably the first time in my life that, that really I experienced that. But, you know, I've got to say probably that the, the fav, favorite, favorite team from that perspective was, was that Spurs team because it had everything. It had flair, it had personality and the game was very different back then. And, you know, there was everything around that, that Spurs team. But for me, it's got to be that you know, got to be Tottenham Hotspur, um, and within that, probably the, you know one of my favourite players back then was 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 Glenn Hoddle, and I think you know if we had Glenn Hoddle that was gracing the football pitch now with his vision, and you know I, th- I think he was very much a, I won't say underrated because I think those in, within the game knew, but he was you know he was a genius footballer, and so so going back, it was Spurs and it was Glenn Hoddle. No, that's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, again. Thank you so much. What a, what a great conversation. Um, cool. I wanted to kind of um, let you close, it, close us out and kind of saying anything you got going forward, anything you want to share, kind of if it's in the sports science that you got uh, that you want uh, viewers to know about or any plans with Wales. Um, and then you can kind of close us out and then we'll go on our way. Yeah, I mean, I've got a little thing going on uh, with, with a couple of guys, and um, one of them's Lee Hancock. We, we, we've developed a kind of uh, platform for, for 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 players. It'll be a development tool across the, the four corners, so the technical, tactical, physical, and, and mental. And Lee's be part of that, and that's something that that we're looking player toolbox. We, we're going to be looking to to kind of launch that this year. I think it's going to be really cool and really smart for young players, players of of all ages and, and development kind of. Needs. I think there's, there's certainly a. I think there's a there's a space in the market really that it, you know to, to to give players a level of support to give them a level of education around the game and for us it's you know player toolbox is is kind of innovative innovative and we're looking at ways to to really increase the tools within within an athlete and a, and a player's toolbox so to speak so that's on on the on the horizon we're looking to launch that sort of the back end of the summer and hopefully. You know, it'll be a good product. It'll be, I think, it, it, it'll be an interactive package for players and, and for parents and coaches. So we're looking forward to that. And then obviously, looking ahead, Sean, we missed out on the Euro 2020s. So Wales next year, Euro 20, 2021. Uh, really looking forward to that. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a great tournament. Uh, we're gonna, we've got a fantastic set of young players coming through the Welsh system. Um, it'll be their opportunity. We've got players that are coming to to that point of their career where they really want to, you know, they, they really want to make a point. Your Gareth Bowers and Aaron Ramses, and we have a really good blend of kind of youth and experience. And I'm really looking forward to that. 
next year and you know we we missed out it was something that was we planned so diligently this year we missed out on it but you know i can't wait it's going to be 12 months but that'll come around quick so uh, they're, they're two key things for the future fantastic fantastic thank you so much tony 